Holy crap, I just realized I kind of look like MC Swigger right now. The black t-shirt and the black baseball cap. <laughs> George, George, George of the jungle, strong as he can be. Watch out for that tree. George, George, George of the jungle, looks like that's free. Watch out for that tree. When he gets to the scrape, he makes his escape with the help of his friend. A big, 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 and away he'll schlep on his elephant chef, Magnolia and Ursula stay in step. George, George, George of the jungle, friend to you and me. So I feel like what's caused this video to get made is like a, a rabbit hole in itself. So I'm going to try and explain the events of what led to me making this video for the Blockbuster show. So it all starts with the series itself. George of the Jungle, it was a 60s cartoon and it only went for like one season. And then years down the road, it was eventually turned into a cartoon for Cartoon Network in 2007. Again, it only went for one season. It was at a very critical point in time where a lot of Cartoon Network's programming was starting to become a lot of Flash animated stuff imported over from Canada with a lot of Canadian voice actors. Uh, you know, this was around the time they started getting all the Total Drama Island shows and Johnny Test and a bunch of stuff like that. And this was no exception. Like I said, it only went for one season. And uh, years go by, and almost a decade later, 2016, uh, I guess the same animation studio? I'm not sure if it's the same creative staff, I didn't look that much into it. But uh, yeah, I guess the, the same animation studio still had the rights to it, and instead of saying, oh, let's just reboot it, let's make a new series, I guess they just figured that they had a lot of the same assets, so they just decided to just restart the series. So it's kind of a reboot but it still has the same animation style and a lot of the same character designs. And the reason that I know about this is, well, it all goes back to Kid Icarus. He did a review of the PlayStation 2 game. Chim, chim, chim of Kid Icarus, watch out for that shitty game. Wait, excuse me? Uh, there's a YouTuber by the name of Mars Reviews who did a video talking about the second season and pretty much gave me a lot of the information that I needed um, I also tried skimming the, the Wikipedia page talking about this very briefly just to get kind of a, a hint of what to expect. This video isn't really me reviewing the show, it's really just me pointing out the points that interest me and the apparent changes that happen between the seasons, revival, or reboot, or whatever the fuck you want to classify this show as. Yeah, that, that, that's pretty much the, the huge rabbit hole that led to this point. Started in 2007, series doesn't happen for a very long time till 2016, and then shortly after that, Kid Icarus does a review, then Mars Reviews does a video, and then ultimately it comes dripping down to me. So yeah, I guess it's appropriate for Blockbusters, because uh, I did a review of George of the Jungle 2 on Blockbusters, and I thought it was a really terrible straight-to-video sequel to a movie that I really liked growing up. The second one I only saw once, and that's why I decided to do a review of it, because it is so fucking awful. Um, and yeah, if you want, you can check out the review. Yeah, I figured it'd be kind of a, a spiritual successor to that video in a lot of ways. You talk about George of the Jungle 2, which is a crappy George of the Jungle live-action movie, and now we get to talk about the crappy second season of well, what was already not a very great George of the Jungle cartoon anyways. I actually had to scramble to try and find footage of the first season of George of the Jungle. Um, and from what I've seen, there are a lot of differences between the first season and this season. But um, from the clips that I was able to find, the, the first season wasn't that great. It just seemed kind of mediocre at best. It's like maybe really little kids would like it. Um, it, it definitely was around this time when Cartoon Network shows were just getting really bad. Um, and it wasn't necessarily their fault, it's not like they made it in-house. Like I said, at the time they were just importing a bunch of stuff that they got from Canada, uh, so that way their channel had variety. I, I guess the studio held on to those assets and instead of just making a new series they were like, well, we still got a lot of these character designs and, uh, you know, well, none of the studios are picking up and it seems like the new big thing these days is to go straight to YouTube so we can just put these videos on YouTube and make them exclusives there so that way people can watch the videos online. They don't even have to go through TV because no one watches TV anymore. 
that's what I'm guessing their thought process was. And in a way, that's kind of genius. It's like, yeah, the people nowadays will put their kids in front of the internet. And that kind of plays into a thing I want to bring up later. I'm sad to say this ain't no has-been hotel. This ain't no hellbenders. This is a whole other fucking level of, I don't even know what the hell I just watched. Just like when I did my review of Real Rob for Blockbuster Show, uh, my overall limit of how many episodes of a show I'll watch before I decide whether or not to turn it off is three episodes. And that is exactly what I did with this. I sat down to watch three episodes. One episode specifically I wanted to check out just because it was a very big point in the Mars Reviews video. Um, so that was the one episode I knew for a fact I had to sit down and see out of sheer morbid curiosity. And the other two episodes were just kind of like, I think they were the first two in the, the playlist. Uh, this season has a total of 26 episodes. But it said the total of segments, whatever that means, is 54. So you have 26 episodes and 54 segments total. So make of that as you will. But I sat down and watched at least three episodes. And, uh, well... I'll talk about some of the key differences and then kind of talk about some key plot elements and more specifically what needs to be addressed when it comes to discussing this season of this particular cartoon. So like I said earlier, the character designs are basically the same. The only differences that stick out are uh, this time George is no longer skinny. This time they tried giving him like you know, a buff body. Um, and this was one thing I did find out. I, I believe it was on the Wikipedia page for it, or it was in the Mars Reviews video. Um, the reason for stuff like that getting changed was because they wanted to be more like the 60s cartoon. Uh, so yeah, they made George Buffer. And uh, another thing they changed was the, the two girls that are in the show, Magnolia and Ursula, they changed their names. So I guess it makes more sense with the George of the Jungle movie, because Ursula was the name of the the woman from modern society that George fell in love with. Uh, so I guess they were trying to switch that around. It also makes sense in that regard that Ape now has like a foppish British accent instead of having like a deeper kind of voice. George, what's happened to your King of the Jungle confidence? He sounds more like a foppish British guy. I guess, I, maybe that was part of the 60s cartoon. I'm not entirely sure. I didn't watch the 60s cartoon at all. Um, but I, I know for a fact that he has a British accent in the live action movies because he was played by uh, John Cleese. So maybe they were trying to play up that aspect as well. Maybe that was part of the 60s cartoon, I guess. The great furried one, he's the jerko lemming supreme being. They worship him. The thing I want to point out with some of the character differences is in the first season from the clips that I could find, um, Magnolia, the jungle girl, uh, in the first season she had this like, kind of valley girl, kind of southern belle voice, like, she just kind of talked like this, oh man, that's just so exciting, and, oh, Moxie. <laughs> uh, why don't we take him to my dad and see if he can do something uh, witch doctory? In this season, she acts like a stereotypical cave woman, like, she just, you know, always grunting, very animalistic, very primal, um, you know, threatening to hurt people and, you know, willing to, to beat people up and, and eat creatures live. That's something we'll get to much, much later. I, we have to address that. <laughs> and it's just really weird finding like a compilation of clips from the first season and then watching episodes of this. It really is just a stark contrast. Like Ape is kind of the same, just different voice and I, a little bit of a different personality, I guess. Uh, but he's pretty much just voice of reason. And Ursula is, you know, the woman from modern civilization who has to try and adapt to their way of life. And George, uh, I mean, in the first season, he's mostly played as dumb. And I mean, they have some of his stupidity here, but it feels like they try to play up more of like the heroic side of it. Like, oh, he's just a big, strong, buff idiot versus the first season. It just felt like he was just out and out an idiot. Another change is this guy, I think, was supposed to be the father of Ursula in the first season. He, he was the scientist character. Uh, this time around, though, he's the villain. Yeah, he, he's a villain because he likes science and he wants to destroy the jungle and he wants to, like, get rid of animals. Uh, and his name is Dr. Chicago, which is a spin on uh, Dr. Shivago. 
And for some reason, he has a giant sentient tooth who looks up to him as a father figure to the point where he calls him dad. From Chicago to Chicago. More and more and more. Dad? Ow! Dad? Ow! Dad? Ow! Dad! Ow! Like, what the fuck do you even say to that? So the three episodes that I saw, they follow a very basic format. They have the kind of, oh, the bad guy is up to no good. He has some kind of evil scheme. He's trying to, you know, hurt animals or, or get rid of animals, you know, ruin the jungle. And then George has to come in and save the day. This is my jungle now, fancy feathers. <gasps> jungle for animals, not bad doctor. No, it's not that. It's the characters just getting into wacky shenanigans, interacting with each other, and ooh, ooh wacky banter and wacky antics between all of our main characters who kind of seem like they all don't like each other. Magnolia's attitude is really fucking bad, and she's constantly just harassing, yelling at, and physically assaulting the other characters, and it gets really uncomfortable. First lesson, never say please. Got it, thank you. <laughs> Second lesson, never say thank you. Okay. Don't get me wrong, I like shows that have asshole main characters. I like Seinfeld, I like It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, a hell of a boss. All that kind of thing. I like stuff like that. I have nothing wrong with shows that have asshole main characters when it's done correctly. It's just really uncomfortable when they do it in this show because it's just not funny at all. It just kind of feels like either really forced cartoony slapstick uh, or just it just feels like an excuse for characters to yell at each other. Um, and even then, like that's like the one thing that I'm really starting to get weary of now with newer episodes of It's Always Sunny. The, the scenes where it just feels like people are yelling for the sake of yelling... It, it stopped being funny to me a very long time ago, um, and it sure as shit ain't funny when they do it in this cartoon. Yeah, the episodes that I was able to watch, they followed this basic format. They had stuff like this, but the one thing that I have to talk about when it comes to this show is the fucking really weird fetishy shit. I mean, nowadays there are people who will specifically analyze cartoons to see if there are like hidden fetishy things put in there. You know, you have people acknowledging like furry fetishes or, you know, uh, there's a Total Drama Island cartoon that has like fart fetishes. Um, and, you know, the, the, the whole Dan Schneider scandal with all the weird foot fetish stuff that he would put in, in his shows when he was part of Nickelodeon. Um, oh my God, does all of that apply to this fucking show. The, one of the big things that often pops up is characters getting eaten, and that's, um, I think it's called like Vor Fetish. That pops up a lot in this series. Delicious they are! <laughs> You'll have characters get eaten by animals. You'll sometimes have characters eat other characters. And it really does just feel like DeviantArt fan fiction or DeviantArt fan art. Um, and that specifically applies to this one episode that I'll, I'll get to in a second. George wonder why he saved it over and over when all George get in return is Big Bobos. Big Bobos! A good question. Every time this show does anything, I can't help but just sit back with my arms crossed going, that's probably someone's fetish. Like, <laughs> like, there's that weird feeling in the back of your mind where you're like, I, f I don't know if they're doing that to be funny or if they're doing that to fuel some kind of weird fetish boner they have. Um, but there is this one episode that really sticks out from the rest. Okay, the plot is that Ursula comes across these bug creatures and she starts eating the bugs because, I mean, that's a thing that people do when they're out in, in, out in the woods that or in, in nature. Uh, bugs are apparently a good source of protein. If I was a crazy delicious bug, I wouldn't go around dancing on other people's tongues. <laughs> You're doing it again! Sorry, sorry. You know you guys are better than peanuts, right? I'll go now. It was at that point I just sat there and thought, so... One of our main characters just basically committed genocide by eating these bugs that are sentient and can talk. But like this is what I'm talking about when you, when you have main characters that do unlikable things in this cartoon. Like in something like Sunny or Curb Your Enthusiasm or Seinfeld or something like that, 
it's usually played as like so over the top and petty and neurotic. That's what makes it funny. In this show, you're just like, you know, she just ate like half a colony of living creatures that she gauged full conversations with. That's kind of fucked up. <laughs> Make me smart. Make me smart. You are Dan. Get out of here. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, after she eats like half this colony of insects, she starts to develop super intelligence, which helps her with her nature documentation. But then she starts transforming into one of these things. She starts growing limbs. Uh, she starts losing hair, starts growing antennae. And I was just sitting there like, OK, is that like, is that a fetish transformation fetish? Is that a thing? I, it's really bad when you start thinking that while watching something, you, you just sit back going, someone probably got off to this. That That's the worst part of it. Um, and th like the, the worst part of the transformation thing is her ass grows big. And like there's a shot where she specifically looks down and sees how huge her ass is. And it really just looks like someone's weird Photoshop fan art on DeviantArt. It really does, but it's put in the show as an actual thing that happens. <laughs> and yeah, needless to say, by the end of the episode, she basically turns into just like a giant insect type creature, like these things that she was eating. It's, it's just like, like, okay, yeah, that's the payoff. It's like, you know, classic comedy cartoon thing of, like, oh, karma, you know, oh, like the you are what you eat kind of like, you know, moral, I guess. If you even want to call that a moral. Finally, the cure. And I did it without eating a single crunch bug. As science is my witness, I will never eat crunch bugs again. But it, it just, the way they went about it was so like, unsubtly fetishy that it made it 10 times creepier to watch. And it was at that point when I started thinking, okay, did they just make this cartoon as a backdoor way to try and crowbar in all this weird vor fetishy type of thing? And this is what I was referencing earlier. This is the, the timeline of things seems really appropriate because 2016, that was at a time where we got all that weird Elsa Gate shit. That was when we got those people doing those weird videos aimed at children where they would dress up as like Spider-Man and Elsa and Batman, Spider-Man, Iron Man, uh, some other Disney princesses like Wolverine. They, they would always have these weird suggestive themes. You'd have them eating chocolate and then they'd call the video like eating poop and stuff like that. You'd have like, you know, highlighting people's feet. So like lots of foot fetish stuff in there. You'd have thumbnails of like something going up someone's butt and all this like, uh, you know, people turning into mermaids and like all this weird fetishy shit that was being pushed onto children. Um, and this is allegedly why Kappa was created and that's a whole other tangent right there. But yeah, all this weird stuff aimed at children with highly suggestive themes and really fetishy content um, and that was, that was very prominent in like late 2015 and uh, especially a lot in 2016. <laughs> then I started thinking with that in mind, I was like, well, that, de that definitely seems to line up well with you know, what was going on at the time. So I wouldn't be surprised if, yeah, this show was just a backdoor excuse for these people to animate some weird DeviantArt fetish shit and put it into a cartoon and then say, oh yeah, this is just a cartoon your kids can watch. You can put your kids in front of it. You know, you can pu put them in front of their laptop and put this on autoplay while you go do chores or, you know, snort bath salts in the bathroom upstairs. I don't know. And keep in mind, I only watched three episodes. I watched three episodes out of a 26 episode listing. So there's probably a bunch of other shit that I missed, but in the window of time that I spent watching those three episodes, I found so much weird, inappropriate, fetishy type of shit to the point where I was like, I'm done. 
kind of weird because when I talked about Real Rob, I talked about Real Rob mostly because it was reminding me of other shows that felt like Rob Schneider was trying to copy. Like, Rob Schneider was trying to copy shows like Curb Your Enthusiasm, Seinfeld, Louie, stuff like that. And this feels like it was just a bunch of different things that lined up perfectly with how it got created. You know, at that time, there was a lot of inappropriate stuff that was being labeled as children's content on YouTube. Uh, the studio probably had all the assets or at least enough assets. Maybe someone wanted to bring the show back. They couldn't get a lot of the voice actors to come back, but that didn't really matter. They were like, oh, well, it's okay. It's a cartoon. We can switch the voices out. It's, the original, the first season came out in 2007. Doesn't matter. Uh, you know, we can just get new voice actors. And then it feels like there were some people in the underbelly of that who saw it as a perfect opportunity to crowbar in their fetishes and, and give people out there fetish material. So guys, that does it for the Blockbuster videos for this month. Look forward to October. I have three videos planned for next month. Uh, we're going to be talking about some crappy horror movie sequels. We're going to be talking about some uh, family movies that take place on Halloween. Um, I got another crappy live action animation crossover movie that's somehow even below the other ones I've talked about. It's somehow even worse than Cool World and Monkey Bone. I know that seems like kind of a hard act to follow, but believe me, it actually kind of is. Uh, so look forward to, to that when it comes out. But until then, guys, I'm Adam Sykes of The Blockbuster Show, and we will see you guys in the next video. So unsurprisingly, George of the Jungle gets the slaughter today.